All right, guys, so we are going to go over the perioperative nursing part of med search. So basically, we're going to be talking about when a patient has to do a surgical procedure, meaning um, the steps and basically what we have to do in the OR. So perioperative nursing is basically your whole entire umbrella of the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative um steps that we have to go through as nurses for a patient to go into a surgical procedure. So this could be as minor as little procedures to general um, surgeries um, with full generalized anesthesia, hours long, etc. So basically here you guys need to know what each nurse does. So we're going to have nurses in pre-op, we're going to have nurses in intra-op, and we're going to have a nurse in post-op. So they're going to be different nurses. Now, in some cases, you are going to be the same nurse in the pre- and post-op situation. For example, if a patient is going to go into, let's say, a colonoscopy, endoscopy, and things like that, usually they don't have to go into the PACU. They go back to the, um, the floor where they were, which is like the OR floor where they prepare the patients because they weren't under anesthesia for a very long time and um, they kind of like get, you know, they get out of the anesthesia very quickly. So a post-op PACU nurse is not really necessary, necessary in this case. So there are going to be some cases that you are going, to, if you decide to be an OR nurse, um, <clears throat> you might be the patient uh the nurse for the patient that you are going to be giving to the intra-op nurse and also the nurse that's going to be receiving them back this all depends on the surgery of course so for pre-op this begins basically when the patient comes into the hospital if they're scheduled for surgery or if they're transferred to your um or floor um from another another um like a med search floor, ICU, whatever the case is. And basically preoperative um, care uh, ends when we are going to be giving the patient to our nurses that are actually going to be in the OR. Now, the nurses in pre-op could also be nurses that are going to be in, in, the, in, in the OR. So the OR is kind of like a flow system. It all depends. You might be the, the nurse that, you know, ends up with the same patient and you just have to care for them before you send them back to home, um, back home or the med surge or you could be the patient that gets with them um, the nurse that gets them ready and goes in with the doctor to the um, the procedure and the surgery so it all depends um, if you guys ever experience the OR you guys are going to see that um, when you shadow a nurse so in this case, so you guys could have peace of mind and understand it and, and basically um, understand it more in regards to testing. Think about that we have three different nurses, okay? Let's just think that we have three different nurses. So we have your pre-op nurse. This, pa this nurse is going to get ready, get your patient ready, um, take vitals, do everything, um, get them ready, and then they're going to give them off to the intraoperative nurse which is a nurse that is going to be um, basically in the OR with the doctor. And then you have your third nurse. This is your post-op. This is your, um, your nurse that is going to be taking care of the patient after surgery, okay? So basically, um, this is the steps that you have to go through in regards to surgery. Now, for our pre-op nurse... Pre-op nurses are very, very important, just like any other nurse, because not only are you getting ready, um, this patient ready for surgery, but you're basically getting all the basics because you need to know if this patient can go into surgery and if there's anything that is going to um, put them at risk for anything during surgery, okay? So the most important thing is getting a detailed history on this patient um, especially if it's the first time that they ever um, have been in um, the hospital. Uh, so the past medical history is very important. You want to know what the patient has right now. So let's say that if the patient is diabetic, has heart failure, kidney failure, 
any of those things, those things are very, very important. You need to know their allergies. Um, not only are drug allergies important, but also allergies to food, um, latex, bananas, things like that. Um, usually banana and kiwi are indicative of a latex allergy. Um, shellfish, seafood, and things like that indicate that they might be um, allergic to iodine. Um, also mangoes, sometimes if people are allergic to mangoes, usually that correlates with iodine as well. The reason why you need to know this is because there are some surgeries or procedures that are um, done as surgical procedures that contain iodine. Um, so you need to make sure that you are basically not putting iodine in a patient that's allergic to it um, because it could go into a, a full-blown anaphylactic shock. So um, apart from allergies and knowing your patient currently, you want to ask them about any previous surgeries or any problems that they had. The reason why is because past surgeries could indicate or help you understand what could happen with this surgery that is going to happen. For example, if they had a certain complication in, in another surgery, this is very important to document because you could prevent it from happening or you could know that there is a possibility that it's gonna happen and be more, um, I guess, um, prepared for it to occur. Um, medication use is very important. So if you have, let's say, a patient on aspirin, you guys know that aspirin has to be withheld from a surgery within one to two weeks. Um, I believe right now it's, it's a week from surgery and herbal medications are about two to three weeks that they have to be off of it. The reason why is because if they go into a general surgery or a surgery that they are going to probably bleed a lot, um, their clotting factors are not going to be uh, working properly because either they're they're taking aspirin and the blood is really thin and, and the platelets are not working properly or herbal medications could cause this as well. Substance use could cause adverse um, reactions to any medication, anything that we give them in the OR. So it is very important that you address this with your patient you know, you have to learn how to speak to your patient and not tell them, like, hey, are you on drugs? No, but, you know, um, you do need to know if, you know, they they smoke any type, um, anything, like, you know, anything that could put them at risk, if they're on any drug use, alcohol use, any of those things, it's very, very important. <clears throat> okay, so the next bullet point is very, very important in regards to patients that are going into general anesthesia. So patient or family history or reaction, um, history of reactions or problems with anesthesia is very, very crucial. The reason why is because there is something that's called malignant hyperthermia, which we will go over in, in a little bit, that usually, usually, if it happens or occurs in the family, there is a high possibility that you could have it too. In, not have it, but it could happen to you as well. It's basically triggered by different types of anesthesias and things like that. Um, but it's very, very important because um, even though it's going to be in the OR, obviously, just in case it happens, the nurses are more, um, I guess, on the lookout for this to, to, to occur. Um, and then there's also patients that could possibly be allergic to different types of um, anesthesias and anesthetics. So it is very important to know that because you don't, you know, again, you don't want to give them something that they're allergic to. <clears throat> you want to uh, also assess, excuse me, <coughs> you want to also assess the level of anxiety um, and the support system that these patients are having right now with the virus, you know, these patients, these patients are probably going to be alone. Um, so this is not only important now and the these times, but beforehand, like you want to know and see if like, you know, the patient has any support systems and things like that. In regards to anxiety, we usually give them, um, medications right before they we take them to the OR room. Um, and this is, you know, for, uh, to relieve the anxiety because even if the patient says that they're not scared and they're, they're okay, they're still going to be a little bit anxious because it's something that you don't really go through every single day, you know? So, um, you just want to know, 
um, you know, and assess the patient's level of anxiety. You don't want to send them to the OR um, having anxiety attacks and things like that because obviously that's not going to be helpful. We do have to get lab results, um, especially checking clot clotting factors, PT, INR, APTT. We want to see our red blood cells, WBCs. Um, we want to see everything, everything, potassium, calcium, all your, all your um, electrolytes. Everything has to be stable before this patient goes into surgery. This is very, very important. So make sure that you jot that down. Everything has to be stable. Obviously, if the patient is going into an emergency um, surgery or something's happening, then that's not the case. But we're talking about surgeries that are scheduled, surgeries that are needed and stuff. You can't bring in a patient that's unstable to an OR room unless um, the surgery is what's going to help them. Um, for example, if a patient is going to go in for, I don't know, a hip replacement or whatever, and their potassium is abnormal or an electrolyte is abnormal or their blood pressure is high or low, you cannot send this patient into an OR. You have to treat the patient before you send them into an OR, Okay. You have to also assess them for DVTs, um, making sure that you do, I believe it's called the Holman test, um, making sure that they don't have any DVTs because this could lead um, into a pulmonary embolism um, if anything happens in the OR. So you are assessing your patient fully and thoroughly when you are a pre-op nurse. You're doing your head-to-toe assessment, your vitals, your oxygen. You need to assess the patient for pregnancy status if it's a female um, because some of the anesthesia and things like that are contraindicated in pregnancy. And then you also want to know if they have any chronic diseases and things like that. Um, so these are very, very crucial. Make sure that you guys have on your notes that vital signs, head-to-toe assessment, oxygen, all of these things have to be stable before sending these patients off. So you do have a checklist um, as a pre-op nurse that you have to go through. So this is basically something that you have to check off that you did all of this whole entire list that I have um, basically told you guys about. So apart from past medical history, we're also doing the lab profile that we were talking about. We're doing the urine analysis because we have to rule out that this patient doesn't have an infection. Not only are we looking at the white blood cells, but we're looking also at your, um, the urine analysis because that can indicate if the patient has any kidney infection, UTI, um, etc. And then we're also looking at the renal function because remember, we are going to be giving these patients a lot of medications. If their renal function and their GFR is low, what, what do you expect? These patients could go into toxicity. These patients could probably go into something um, in a complication because their kidneys are not f um, fully functioning and they're not going to be able to excrete what we are going to be placing inside them. Um, we do have to do a blood type and cross match. Now remember your religions, remember your um, your faiths and, and all those things. You do always have to get a consent um, if the patient, is, um, you know, would be able, like, would accept blood, um, blood if needed during surgery. So um, if they obviously give you the consent, then you do the, top, uh, the blood type and cross match. Um, because you want to make sure that you have that blood there um, when you um, go into like, you know, the surgery and things like that. You're also going to do a CBC. Um, that's that's also like what I told you guys, um, checking white blood cells, um, infection, um, RBCs, any abnormalities. Your hemoglobin and hematocrit, this is basically going to tell you if the patient is dehydrated, if they're um, extra hydrated. Um, if they have anemia, any abnormalities that has to be treated, um, this is going to indicate it. Your electrolytes are very important, especially potassium and calcium. If those are not stable, you do have to treat it because remember that they work um, accordingly with the heart. So you don't want your patient um, having like a cardiac arrest, dysrhythmias and things like that during surgeries. Um, usually when potassium is abnormal, magnesium is also altered. So the way to treat one is to treat, um, um, and the, the way to treat them is to treat one and then you treat the other one and then they both balance out. 
Your kidney function, like I said, is very important. We're going to be looking at the creatinine in the bun. Um, one little pinpoint that I want you guys to know because I know that you guys are in med search one. You guys might not have learned this in fundamentals. But creatinine and bun do have a major, major difference. And a lot of students don't know this. Yes, both of them are taken to look at kidney function, but they both tell you something different. Your serum creatinine is basically the one that's going to pinpoint how your kidney is functioning, if there's any damage in your kidney, um, and if it's, if it's doing good. Your bun is mostly going to be um, manipulated by ha um, fluid status. So if your bun is... Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if your bun is high, um, the patient is is fluid overload, and if it's low, the patient is dehydrated. Um, I would double check, uh, just in case through the internet, um, and Google or your textbooks. But I believe that's how it goes. But I want you guys to make sure that you know that creatinine is mostly your kidney function, and it is not altered by fluid status. So the patient could be dehydrated or overhydrated. That's not going to basically, um, it's not going to alter their creatinine level. The kidney function is. Now bun, on the other hand, is going to be altered depending on if the patient is dehydrated or overhydrated. That's why we do them together. Okay, so make sure that you guys understand the difference between those two um usually when we are going to give them iv um iv iodine um, medications and things like that the most important one is your creatinine because that is your kidney function now i don't want you guys getting confused with gfr gfr is like the filtering rate so remember that the kidneys have the glomerulus which is like the little filter and then that's also something that goes hand in hand with your creatinine Okay, so um, usually they do check the GFR either way um, just to check how the kidney is functioning and um, basically uh, taking and excreting out everything. We already talked about the pregnancy test because it could be um, risky when it comes to anesthesia. We're always, always going to do a chest x-ray. So this is going to be um, for everyone no matter what age it is. Um, you do have to do a chest x-ray just to make sure that the heart is go doing good and the lungs are doing good um, because we are going to compare it after surgery. And then lastly, we're going to put these patients on the 12 lead EKG. We're going to take their baseline um, rhythm, make sure that there's no dysrhythmias, that there's no STEMI, non-STEMI, that there's no PVCs, there's no anything abnormal other than sinus rhythm, no AFib, no A flutter, nothing like that. Um, and then we're also going to look out for cardiac disease. And then this is very, very crucial for um, patients over 40 because of the anesthesia. But either way, we're doing this on all your patients. So nursing care in regards to the pre-op, this is basically what you have to do apart from like that, um, like assessing, is that you are going to make sure that there is an informed consent. Um, you do have to know um, a few things about the informed consent because most likely it's going to be at least coming up on one of your exams. Um, so for the informed consent, the nurse is just a witness. And I want you guys to understand that. You guys are not the ones teaching the nurse, the, the patient. You guys are not the one that has um, to tell the patient the risk factors, this and that. Um, that's the doctor. So you're basically going to be in the room when the doctor is there. Um, you're going to listen to the doctor, tell them like, you know, this is the surgery. This is why we're doing it. Yada, yada, yada. Everything that he has to say or she has to say. And um, you're basically going to then ask the patient, okay, um, are all your questions answered? Are you okay with everything? Um, are you going to go ahead with your surgery? If the patient tells you yes, then they don't they don't have any questions that um they're gonna go ahead with the surgery. What they what you have them do is that you're going to physically see them sign the consent. So make sure that you guys read your questions correctly. Okay, 
you're, you have to physically see the patient sign it with your eyes, okay? You have to be there. You have to witness it. You can't just, like, give them a paper and then come back and I'm like, oh, okay, you signed it? Cool. Like, no, you have to be there while they're signing the paper. Now, if these patients are going to, no, sorry. If the patient by any chance tells you like, hey, um, you know, I, I felt very overwhelmed. I'm not sure. I need, I, I have questions. When the patient has questions, you have to call the doctor. The doctor is the one that has to disclose anything. Now, if the patient asks you like, a, like something that the doctor already stated, then you are allowed to re um, explain it to the patient, but you cannot add any information that the doctor did not say. Okay, so if you guys get a question in regards to that, um, make sure that the answer choice, if there is one um, to choose from, is that the nurse restates what the doctor said previously. Okay, if it says that the nurse teaches them um, this and that or something like that the doctor hasn't spoken to them about, This is that is wrong, okay? Um, if you're in doubt, usually the answer is call the doctor um, so, they could, uh, so they could talk to the, um, to the patient, okay? Um, so if the patient is going to go into surgery that has to do with the bowel, like the stomach or anything like that, um, they are going to have to do enemas and laxatives. But that's only like for bowel surgeries. You have to do, a, you do have to check the medication prescription. Sometimes when the patient is diabetic, they're going to allow them to um, take insulin. It all depends on what the surgeon and the doctors um, correlate with. Um, that's why it is, it's very crucial for you to know what medications these patients are on because if they take blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, all, any type of medication that they take, you must be aware of it. And you must see if the doctor is telling you to withhold it or to give it before the surgery. Um, and then for the NPO status, uh, you don't really have to necessarily like, I guess, you don't have to physically memorize these numbers. But usually six to eight hours before a surgery the patient shouldn't be eating because usually it takes about like maybe four or five hours to digest um, fully the food. And um, the reason why we put these patients on MPO is because even if the patient is under general anesthesia, there is a risk for aspiration. Um, and that is something that you do not want happening because if someone aspirates anything, this could cause pneumonia, it could cause any type of infection, it could cause Um, lung damage it could cause anything you know so you're trying to avoid that so you're going to tell the patient that six to eight hours they do have to be NPO clear liquids are usually two hours prior if it's general anesthesia but then they kind of extend it a little bit more if it's local anesthesia because they're not going to be fully like asleep um, and then you are basically charting input and output and basically analyzing your patient at all times Before um, you send them off to surgery, you do have to prepare them. So do like a skin preparation. So uh, there's like these little wipies that they have that you have to wipe down your patient completely. Or you could allow them to take a shower. It depends on what they want. Um, if the um, surgery requires that they have to shave in a certain area, The only um, razor that, like, the way that they could shave is electrical clippers. They can't use razors. And um, they must remove everything before surgery. This includes dentures, um, processes, makeup, nail polish. Usually nail polish, they don't need it. But um, glasses, any personal items they have to take. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind because it might come up because they like to test you guys on how you know your cultures and religions and things like that so if the question tells you that you have a patient and you're going to have them go to um i don't like surgery and he's from whatever culture or whatever religion you want to talk about um and they have like this necklace with a pendant or whatever they have and it's religious and they have to keep it and they can't take it off 
you are not going to make these patients take that off. What you're going to do is that you're going to tape it on their on their body um, and tell them like, you know, like, okay, it's fine for you to keep it, but we have to tape it like either like um, on your chest or, or somewhere that it's not going to interfere with the surgery and you must let the surgical team know about it and you document it. But if it has to, if the question tells you that it's something religious or um, or culture or from a culture, you never force the patient to take that off because you're advocating for your patient. Um, so keep that in mind and make sure that you guys jot that down in your notes. And then lastly, you do have to teach your patient in regards to deep breathing, coughing, and early ambulation um, after you... Um, after they finish their surgery. So you do need to know how to educate your patient on the spirometer because um, this device is going to allow your patient to not be at risk for atelectasis, which is a collapsed alveoli, and you do not want that to happen. So um, you, you are going to be um, explaining that to them. Um, you are going to basically, like, like we said, we're, you're going to analyze your patient, make sure that they're good to go, and you're going to establish an IV access, okay? Usually, we put an 18 gauge because if anything happens during the surgery as an emergency, that's the gauge that we need to be able to give blood because it's thick, okay? So, an 18 gauge. Um, so now... Um, you're also going to give them um, medications. So you have your antimicrobial me medications. Um, basically, these are given prophylactically. Um, it's one hour before like a surgery, a surgical incision because the patients are at risk for getting, um, you know, like hospital bound infections and things like that. So they do give them like a general um anti like an antibiotic and then they're going to give them antiemetic and sedatives. Um for the antiemetics they usually give this because um they're going to give them like some of the the general anesthesias and the medications that they give them could cause them to have nausea and vomiting before or after the surgery. So to keep it like I guess on the safe side, um, they give them the antiemetics and then the sedatives. The sedatives are the medications that are going to help ease the anxiety that the patient has and things like that. And you do have to inform the patient and get consent for that before you give these medications. Of course, you can't just, you know, give them medications and stuff. Everything has to be educated. Um, you do have to educate your patient on every medication that you're going to give them on any floor that you that you're on so it doesn't matter if it's the or um they could still actually um tell you like no i don't want the medication okay um regular medications that are usually um given before surgery like i said if patients are on like heart medications diabetes and things like that um doctors might let you uh, or might um allow them to take it because it's good because it will help um prevent like tachycardia dysrhythmias um abnormal um an abnormal ekg during the whole entire time being there so um those are some medications that you do have to be looking out for but of course everything's going to be there like on um on the patient's chart and what you have to give them before so it's not something that you have to like figure out yourself the doctor will tell you like what to hold and what to give um, and then basically, you do have to make sure that your whole entire checklist is complete. So everything that I just spoke to you guys about, that has to be completed before you're going to hand off these patients to the OR team, okay? Um, another important thing when you're handing these patients off um, to, the, to the OR, you do have to, basically, they're going to... Um, you're basically going to hand off the patient, but you're going to give them like report, I guess, if you want to say, um, because you want to make sure that you're handing off the right patient. They want to make sure that they're getting the right patient and the correct surgery is done. Um, if there is like, for example, an amputation going to be taking place, um, something like that, sometimes they even mark the site because unfortunately it has happened before that the wrong um, 
extremities has have been amputated or um, surgeries have been done in the wrong area because of this miscommunication. Okay, so keep that in mind. So going back to the informed consent, um, you just want to make sure that it is signed by your patient. Your patient must must be competent meaning that they are supposed to be aware like if you do your head to toe assessment and they're alert and oriented times four then yes they're able to sign this form if this patient is literally unconscious or they're not um there um usually you they're not the ones that sign the consent form it will be like their their family and things like whoever's um in charge of them whatever the case is but it won't be the patient another thing is that when you are giving um or you're gonna have a patient sign an informed consent you must withhold medications until it's done for example like morphine any med medication that could kind of put them out a little bit you have to withhold until it's signed because then you're they're not going to be fully competent okay um and that's basically it for the informed consent that you need to know about other than if the patient doesn't speak the language that you do. Obviously, you always have to get a trained interpreter. Um, even um, even if um, you guys know the language, remember that you guys are taking a test. So it's not going to say like, yeah, you talk Spanish and the patient talks Spanish, so you don't need an interpreter. No. When you're taking the test, assume that you only speak English. And um, if the patient is from another place that um, speaks anything that isn't English, you have to get an interpreter, okay? In the real world, obviously, that doesn't happen. You always, um, you know, speak to the patient because you know the language. But um, test-wise, you do have to have a licensure in, um, and be allowed to interpret or speak to the patient in that, in that language, okay? Um let's see what else you guys need to know um make sure that you know the role of the nurse that like we spoke about the nurse is just there to witness the signature it they're not there to give or discuss um what the treatment i mean the surgery is about and risk factors and stuff that's all the doctor okay that's the doctor you are there just as a witness now, the people that are not supposed, that are not allowed to sign informed consents are usually the children that are less than 18 years old, okay, um, and that are not emancipated. So, if the, pay, the, the child is 18 years old or older, or if they're um, younger than 18, but they're emancipated, then they are allowed to sign their own informed consent, okay? Um, now, um, another thing for the, the informed consent is that if you have a child, let's say that you have a child and she's 15 and she's currently pregnant, she is basically able to sign off for anything. Once this patient has and delivers the baby, she is back under her parents, okay? That's something that you guys need to know, not only for med surge, but like for, um, for any other class because those questions kind of come up a lot on proctor exams and things like that. So make sure that you guys are very, very like aware of the informed consent and you guys read about it, okay? Now, the people that are allowed to um, grant consent for another person is um, the parent of a minor, if they're under 18, a legal guardian, someone from the court, an individual that has power of attorney um, and authority for, for health care, um, emancipated minors we already spoke about. Um, so these are the patients that are that are unable to sign the consent themselves these are the people that are allowed to sign it for them so if you have let's say an unconscious patient um if they have a legal guardian then they get to sign it um if that's not the case and they have i don't know um a power of attorney then those are the people that are going to sign the consent okay 
So it all depends on your patient. Um, so basically there's a lot of teaching. Um, usually half of this teaching you have to do it again once the patient starts to wake up. But it is very important to teach your patient before surgery because you don't want them waking up and, and having like a heart attack because of something that they're seeing and they didn't expect. For example, you're going to teach the patient that if they're going to go into surgery that you know that they're going to come out with a Foley catheter or a peg tube or a colostomy or anything abnormal in their body, you do have to teach your patient. You have to tell them like, hey, look, after the surgery, you're going to have a tube in this section of your body. Um, it's going to either come out this this day, that day, or if this happens, if that, you know, you have to explain it to them. Because imagine if you're going into surgery and then you wake up all of a sudden and you have like a tube in, uh, you know, in your body and you didn't think that you were going to have anything. You're going to think you're the first thing that you're going to think is that you're either ha like you had a complication and you're dying or something or something happened, you know, and you're going to freak out. So the best thing to do to prevent your patient from freaking out is being as more open as you can with them and explaining to them and teaching them everything possible. OK, you want to. um explain to them how important early ambulation is because of the risk factor of dbts um deep breathing and coughing with your spirometer so you need to teach them how to use it usually it is 10 times every hour um because you want to prevent from your lungs to collapse um so basically just teaching your patient everything that they have to do um explaining like explaining that um explaining to them what to expect after surgery as well even though half of the stuff that you're gonna say again they won't remember okay but there's some that do remember Alrighty, so we already went over this so the incentive spirometer you can either think about it 10 times in an hour um or just um saying that they have to use it every one to two hours so it depends on how they ask you on your exam but make sure that you know that that it's 10 times every hour or every one to two hours, okay? And then for your interventions, we already spoke about this though, um, what, we has, what has to be held, so aspirin, your herbs, fever few, regular medications that um, the doctor tells you, you have to prepare the bowel if it's needed, assess pain scale, and then you have to tell them that they can't smoke either 24 hours before the surgery. Now, um, there are different risk factors that could occur with anesthesia, either general or local. Usually the general is the one that has most complications. Um, but either way, whatever it is, your airway patency is the main priority in all situations. Um, but sometimes cardiac could actually be first. So it all depends on um, what's going on. So for example, if the patient um, is having like a hypovolemic shock and they're bleeding out, you have to treat cardiac first before you do airway, if that makes sense. Um, I don't believe they're going to ask you a question in MedSearch 1 in regards to that. So just leave that for when you guys go into MedSearch 3 and you guys go into, um, you know, intensive care and, and stuff like that. But there are cases that you will treat cardio first, but most likely it's always airway, okay? And I want you guys to know the difference between, because I know that you guys remember ABCs, and I want you guys to remember that A is airway and B is breathing, and they're both different. Airway is making sure that there is an airway. So, meaning you have to do the head tilt, you have to do a tracheostomy, you have to open the airway, that is first. Breathing is second. So oxygen, um, respiratory rate, and all of those things are secondary. So if you have, like, for example, a choice, um, and you have to pick between um, doing a head tilt to open airway, and then, but they're not going to put airway. They're just going to put, um, do a head tilt on the patient or give them oxygen. The first thing that you're gonna put is head tilt because why? Because why are you gonna give an why? How are you gonna give oxygen to a patient that doesn't have an airway that that's patent? 
you're basically putting air somewhere that it's not going to go through and circulate because there's no airway to go like to 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 have it go to the lungs if that makes any sense so when you guys are taking um your exams make sure that you remember airway goes before breathing for general anesthesia we talked about the um, malignant hyperthermia this is why we do have to ask the patients if they have had this in, in like previously in any surgeries or if their blood family member have had the, um this situation because it could run in the family So general anesthesia kind of takes a little bit more time to get the patient down because it has your induction, your maintenance, and emergence phase. So inducing the patient is basically with their benzos, um, your propofol, and then your fentanyl and things like that. Um, and then these help, you know, the general anesthesia. And then you basically maintain your patient um, asleep. Uh, so, you know, you could do the surgery. So you want to make sure that for your exam you know your antidotes and you want to keep these antidotes always in mind um, because they do come up often so if the patient is on any type of opioid your um, antidote is your narcan which is nalox naloxone and then if you give them um, benzos and they uh, you know something happens with the benzos you're going to give them flumazenil okay your anesthetics are basically your opioids and benzos, like I said. So fentanyl is usually the one that is usually the, you know, the one that they use. Um, and then your benzos, the most common one is diazepam. So this is basically to kind of get your patient relaxed and kind of sleepy and then also to reduce their anxiety. For your sedatives, this is to obviously sedate your patient. Um... And then it's going to be your pentobarbital or secobarbital. It usually ends in barbital. Um, and this is basically to induce now your general anesthesia. Now there's one that I want you guys to make sure that you guys know for your exam. And it's your neuromuscular blocking agent, which is um, succulo... I can never say this. Succicoline or something like that. Bencoronium. So... What they might trigger, like target on your um, on your exam is what you have to do before giving this medication. Now think about it. This medication is a neuromuscular blocking agent, meaning it's going to block functions of your muscular system, like your muscles and your neural um, system in your body. So if you know that your heart is a muscle, you know that your lung is a muscle and things like that, the first thing that you're going to do is put this patient on a mechanical ventilator. You cannot give this medication before you have this patient on a mechanical ventilator because you're basically going to paralyze them and you're going to kill them. Okay, so you do have to have an air, um, a airway placement um either like intubate them or tracheostomy whatever the case is and they do have to be connected to a mechanical ventilator so if you guys get a question on this patient the first thing that you have to do before giving the pa the patient the medication is putting them on a mechanical ventilator then you have your antiemetics the most common one is on dacitron this is basically for the nausea and vomiting before and after the surgery your anticholinergics, um, usually they'll give them if it's needed. Um, it's basically like your atropine. Um, it's just to decrease like any risk of like abnormal um, uh, heart, like heart rates. So like atropine is basically to um, I guess it will be. How can I explain to you guys? Since the patient is gonna be packed with like so many meds there is a risk that the heart is going to kind of slow down and not do its work because it's going to get kind of like sleepy and tired because of all the medications so they give atropine because it is going to kind of boost up and give energy to the heart so the heart doesn't go into bradycardia okay because if the patient goes into bradycardia during this procedure 
bradycardia leads to le uh, decreased cardiac output, which leads to decreased um, blood flow in areas. And you don't want that because you want to make sure that blood is circulating properly during surgery. So your nursing actions, we already went over, so you guys don't need to know that. Now we need to go over malignant hyperthermia. So I was explaining to you guys that you do have to assess your patient and ask them for prior history in regards to this and also for their family history. Malignant hyperthermia basically means that there is a medical emergency and um, it's basically that the patient's um, temperature gets altered and they start to have muscle rigidity, okay? So this is like a... This is super, super, super like important to treat right away because their temperature goes high rocket. It could pass over 111 Fahrenheit. Okay, that is very, very high. So the way that you're going to treat malignant hyperthermia and what you have to have in the room for it is that you have to have your dantrolene IV. Dantrolene basically relaxes the muscles because remember that when the patient has malignant hyperthermia, they're going to get rigid with high increased temperature. So dantrolene is going to relax these muscles. You're going to give them oxygen at 100% and you're going to be monitoring their ABGs. You're going to give them iced normal saline 0.9% because they have high, high temperature and you're trying to lower it. And you're going to put them on um, on cooling blankets and then also monitor input and output and the blood pressure to, um, to monitor for shock. Okay. And of course, if the patient goes into malignant hyperthermia, obviously you do have to stop the surgery and treat the malignant hyperthermia. Sometimes you can either continue the surgery or they won't be able to depending on how, you know, how bad it, it is. Um, so your local anesthesia, this is basically um, just anesthesia that it is uh, placed in one specific area where the surgery is going to be taking place and the patient could be ex basically wide awake. So if you guys have seen, like for example, Dr. Pimple Popper, um, she uses lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic, and then basically she's able to extract and take out like the lipomas and all of those things without the patient feeling anything, okay? But they're fully awake, they're talking to her, etc. Um, so your common one uh, usually is lidocaine, all right? So when you are going to be giving um, these patients all of these medications, um, you do have to monitor the cardiac status. Um, you know, you want to uh, look at the Foley catheter, if they have it, usually when a patient is going to go into like um, general anesthesia, they put the Foley catheter because of peristalsis due to the anesthesia and um, as well as like paralysis of like the, the muscles, uh, the detrouser, I think it's a trouser muscle or something like that. It's like the bladder muscle so they won't be able to pee. Um, so that's why they do the Foley catheter. Okay. And then you're just monitoring your patient. All right, so let me know any of that. We already talked about that. All right, so the post-op nurse. So this is um basically you. So just to go back, the medications and stuff like that. Um, that is your intra-op because remember that I told you that when you were handing off your patient. Um, you're basically giving them report and you, and you're taking your, you know, your patient, you're handing off your patient to, um, the surgical team. And then the surgical team is the one that puts them on all these medications. The only medications that you're giving the patient as a pre-op nurse is like your diazepam, um, any opioids like fentanyl and things like that. Sometimes even fentanyl is given inside the ER, the OR, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, the general anesthesia and the anesthetics and all of those things, those are given in the actual OR room, meaning that, that everything that I just spoke about was your intra-op um, nurse. Now we're going to go to the post-op. Post-op is basically you receiving your patient after surgery. This is very, very crucial, and these, these nurses are very, very important. The reason why is because these nurses have to make sure 
that these patients come out of surgery and they stabilize and they don't go into any complications. Um, you know, they wake up and, and they're able to understand what's going on and things little by little. Obviously, it takes time, especially if they were in like long extensive surgeries and, and a lot of anesthesia. Okay, so you are going to receive your patient um, from surgery and um, you're the post-op nurse. What you're going to do is that you're going to assess your patient all over again. So everything that most likely your pre-op nurse did, you're going to reassess the patient and you're going to compare it with what the pre-op nurse documented. The reason for this being is that you cannot discharge your patient from the floor until gag reflex is um, gag reflex has returned. Um, until uh, they are urinating 30 milliliters per hour. And basically, um, if, if their vitals are unstable or not matching the vitals and the labs that they came in with, um, they have to be treated before either being sent home or being sent to another um, floor. Okay, so those are your things. Um, but most likely, your priority is always airway, so make sure that you always... Um, analyze the patient's airway. Sometimes they could come out surgeries with tracheostomies and things like that, but other times they're just regular and you just want to make sure that their airway is working and functioning correctly, um, especially being on those medications for so, so long. They do depress the, the respiratory um, system. So complications that you want to look out for, um, you don't have to memorize this. Usually it's kind of uh, just knowing the complications, not when it's going to start, because oh, again, this is something that like, it could happen to anyone, but like at a different moment. Okay. So atelectasis could occur like earlier than 48 hours, but, um, like I'm saying, uh, you just need to know like kind of like complications to look out for apart from atelectasis. And usually that happens if they don't use their incentive spirometer and things like that. They could get infection, they could go into shock, they could have urinary, urinary retention up to three days because of the anesthesia, that's why we put the Foley's. Um, they could get UTIs due to the Foley being in place for too long. Paralytic ileus is something very common, um, well not common, but it's something that you have to look out for because um, the, the intestines could paralyze and then they might not be able to... Um, you know, go to the bathroom. And then another way, uh, no, another thing is that apart from stability and vitals and labs and, and things like that, the patient is not going to be able to um, be discharged until not only do they urinate 30 milliliters, but they, they pass gas, like a uh, flatus. So um, they do have to pass gas before being um, discharged because we want to make sure that they don't have a paralytic ileus. So the risk factors um, that you have to watch out for as well is anemia due to blood loss, um, hypovolemia because of like the lack of perfusion that was occurring during surgery because obviously they had a wound, um, hypothermia, and then immobility. So immob immobility goes hand in hand with like respiratory um, because if the patient uh, doesn't start moving around and things like that, it could cause respiratory complications, um, circulatory uh, complications, pressure ulcers because of like the pressure um, on those bony prominences. So all of these things are, so are like very, very crucial to look at being a post-op um, nurse and everything has to be documented their cardiac system the respiratory vitals everything everything has to correlate with one another so if you receive the pa if you if they receive the patient with like let's say a blood pressure of 120 over um yeah 120 over like 72 they should be releasing and discharging this patient with a blood pressure in the same range so like around 121 122 you know in the same range around there because if they came in and their blood pressure was 120 over 71 and then in there in the pack you and the blood pressure is 240 over 100 and something something's going on and it has to be treated right away 
if that makes sense to you guys. So your PACU nurse, again, like I said, does the same thing that the uh, pre-op nurse does, the full head-to-toe assessment. You want to make sure that during surgery, the patient didn't uh, obtain a wound. Um, you know, you want to document where their surgical incision is, what you see. You want to make sure that the surgical incision is not infected um, or starts si uh, showing signs of infection. They have to make sure that the patient is um, hydrated, their airway and breathing is uh, um, is good. You want to check capillary refills. Everything that you do at the beginning, you're doing at the end as well, okay? You're giving them oxygen if needed. Circulation is very, very important. So you're looking out for capillary refills, necrosis, abnormal um, skin color, and things like that. So the vitals usually are taken every 15 minutes um, when the patient comes out of surgery until the patient starts kind of like waking up and, you know, speaking and stuff like that. But uh, vital signs are very important every 15 minutes, especially after so much anesthesia because, you know, anything could, could occur, okay? Um, we already talked about input and output. You want to look for bladder distension, but usually um, they have the catheter and you just, you're looking for the 30 milliliters per hour. You're looking at the, um, the uh, surgical wound. You want to document um, all of the stuff that you're looking at. So if the patient has like um, a surgical wound then with staples um, or like, um, like stitches and stuff, you just, you you have to make sure that you document that because as the PACU nurse, you're going to be having to monitor that every so often to make sure that the patient is not getting like um, infection and things like that. Okay. Um, so there is a criteria that I've been talking about, but I didn't really specify. There is a criteria that you have to um, go by to be discharged from the PACU or from the OR and things like that, okay? So the Aldrich score is basically 8 out of 10, okay? This is like just a basically a scoring system that they have um, to, to be sure that um, that they're releasing you and discharging, um, discharging you with no complications. Stable vital signs, like I said, that's why they have to compare from the beginning to the after of the surgery. Um, that there's no evidence of bleeding because if there is, obviously you have to treat it and um, stop it from, from occurring. Your gag, cough, and swallowing reflex must be back because you are not going to send the patient home with gag reflex um, problems and then have them choke or aspirate at home and then, you know, cause other damage. So yes, you do have to assess that and you cannot release these patients until they have that reflex back. Um, they shouldn't have massive nausea and vomiting. If they do, you have to keep them until it goes away and give them medication. If they have like minimal nausea and vomiting, that's normal because of the anesthesia. And then of course, your, uh, your urine output has to be at least 30 milliliters per hour to either take out the Foley or if they don't have a Foley to be discharged. And also the passing of gas is not in here, but it is something new that um, they will not discharge you unless um, that, that happens, okay? So um, we already talked about how important airway is. Positioning your patient, um, especially after surgery, is crucial because of DVTs. So one thing that might come up on the exam um, is the no pillows under the knees. The reason why is because if you put the patient's um, uh, knees, like a pillow under the knees, it's going to compress the popliteal vein, I mean the artery. Um, I, is it the vein or the artery? Oh my god, I'm, I'm like literally going crazy. Um, I think it is a vein. No, it's an artery. So the popliteal artery, I think I'm right. I hope I am. But anyways, it compresses um, that area. And um, basically, it's going to um, not allow the blood to flow properly. And um, yeah, that's basically what happens. Okay, early ambulation to prevent DVT, promote circulation. Again, 
um, assess pain level. All of these things are basically um, very important. Of course, this is what, you know, you want to make sure that the patient is leaving the OR the way that they came, okay? Unless, obviously, something happened in surgery or whatever, but that's not, we're not talking about, don't think outside of the box for now, just think inside of the box. Like, you want the patient to leave the same way they came out, okay? Um, even with the scar. So, you want to administer um, fluids, keep your patient hydrated. If they have to be MPO, you could give them ice chips um, and make sure that you ch uh, do oral hygiene. You want to check the kidney function again because you want to make sure that the kidneys are still functioning correctly after all of that massive amount of medications that we had to give them. Okay. If the patient has um, an incision or a wound, the way to um, basically promote wound healing is high calories and high protein. A way that you could check if um, their protein levels are getting better is if you look at the labs and you look at albumin. Albumin is one of the types of proteins that is very important in our body. And um, it usually should be above 3.5 for you to know that the patient has adequate um that they have adequate, uh, what is it called, um, protein in their body for to promote wound healing. Okay. You're also assessing the bowel function because remember the peristaltic, uh, the peristal, um, paralytic ileus because of the general anesthesia. So you want to make sure that you're assessing that you're checking bowel sounds. Um, remember that when you're checking bowel sounds, you want to stay in the quadrant until you hear a bowel sound. And if you don't hear it, you have to stay until five minutes to confirm that there is no bowel sound, okay? Um, Thromboembolism um, is like your DVT, so we already kind of talked about it again. Early ambulation, compression socks. Um, you want to reposition your patient every two hours. Keep in mind, if the patient does have like a hip replacement or something of the hip, you have to log roll these patients, um, because if not, you're going to basically, um, just like not dislodge, but like you're going to damage the hip area. Okay. If the patient is in a wheelchair, they should be shifting, um, their weight or their, you know, shifting themselves in the, in the wheelchair every 15 minutes. Um, and then, like I said, um, with the teaching that you had to teach them about the incisions and the drains, um, some of these patients will have drains, some of them will have uh, different types of incisions and, and tubes and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're aware of those drains, um, like the PEG tube, the, the Foley catheter, the NG tube, all of those things. And you want to make sure that um, wherever they have their incision or wound, um, that you're assessing it, that you're assessing for infection, um, the drainages. You want to uh, kind of keep that in mind because sometimes... Um, for MedSearch 1, they do put fundamental questions on your quizzes because of the fundies proctor. So make sure that you know your different drainages. The sanguineous is is, um, is bloody. Serosanguineous is um, like kind of like watery blood type. Um, sang uh, serious is serous is like just like the white um, the whitish kind of clear one. And then there is the purulent. Purulent is um is like pus. Think about pus and pus, and then I think it's purial sanguineous or something like that, which is like pus and blood. I don't know. It's super weak. Okay, so all of those things you have to be keeping in mind that you are monitoring, and also when the patient starts waking up, you're teaching them, especially when you have to teach them about deep breathing and coughing again. And the incentive spirometer, if they have like an abdominal incision or any type of incision, when they do the coughing, coughing and breathing, they do have to splint their incision so it doesn't burst and cause an um, evisceration or dehiscence. Okay. Uh, for discharge teaching, this is when your patient is going to like, you know, going to go home or like off to another floor and you have to teach them. And this is basically when they are stable and, and you know that they're good to go. You're going to educate them on any medications that they, they have to take. Activity restrictions depending on the surgery that they that they 
that they get. So maybe they can drive. Maybe they can lift weights for a certain amount of time. They can work for a certain amount of time. So all of those things you do have to inform them about. You inform them about any dietary changes that they have to do or, or you know, ex- encourage them um, with good eating and, and so on. Um, you also have to make sure that you have an emergency contact information um, just in case the patient, you know, something happens, we have an emergency contact. And then they also have one like close by like a phone number or something like that when they go home. So complications that occur in surgery is the dehiscence and evisceration. So the dehiscence is just like a slight um, well, it's not slight, but it's basically like think about like your stitches just like popped out, but all your organs are inside. And then evisceration is when your organs are like completely out, like your intestine comes out or whatever. So for testing purposes, what you guys need to know is mostly about evisceration and what you have to do as a nurse. So if this occurs to your patient, First, you are going to put like a sterile gauze or like you're going to cover the, I guess, cover the incision. Um, If they tell you that you have to do it like by steps or like putting, like put them in order, um, the first thing that you do is obviously stay with the patient, call for help. Um, Usually go by your ATI book, but I believe that covering the wound is the first thing that you have to do. And then... um, you have to lower the head of the the bed, but put um, make make the patient put um basically like bend their knees so they could keep the organs inside um as much as possible, but not putting them inside. So that's something that you are going to be tested on. Like, do you put the intestines or whatever is popping out inside? No, you don't. You do not do that. You just cover it. Um, to prevent infection but you do not try to reinsert these organs because you might reinsert it wrong and you know so many things could happen so no you do not do that and then obviously after you have your patient um, in the position that they're supposed to be in um, you're going to notify the physician And then complications that you want to keep in mind that could occur and you want to look out for, which either way we already spoke about, is airway obstruction, hypoxemia, which is due to um, atelectasis or bad circulation, um, which is low oxygen in the blood, and then hypoventilation because of respiratory depression because of the medications like the opioids, fentanyl, morphine, and all of those things. And that is basically it for our tutoring session. So make sure that you guys know the different phases between surgeries and what each nurse is basically supposed to be on top of. And remember, always, always remember, your pre-op and your post-op nurse are basically your BFFs. Whatever your pre-op nurse gives you, you should receive them and not let them go unless they're equally the same as when the pre-op nurse gave them to you, okay? So just keep that in mind. Make sure that you guys do practice questions on the ATI learning system. Read your ATI books for any extra information. And hopefully this, um, this tutoring helped you guys.